I want to start by saying what a wonderful idea I think it is to have a lecture in memory of uh, David and uh, the work that he has done um, in uh, just advancing knowledge in the areas of early childhood development, in children's self-regulation uh, development, in play, um, just all the wonderful contributions that he's made. And I feel honored to be invited to uh, give the first lecture um, in his memory. So I want to begin just by thinking a little bit about David. I know we all have memories of David. And so I thought I would begin by just sharing a few of my own. I met David when the metacognition SIG of early uh, came to Cambridge, and I believe that was in uh, probably around 2008 or so. Um, I might be wrong on those dates, but um, it was quite a while ago. And of course, David and I, um, with our interests in early in young children's development of self-regulation, immediately hit it off. And uh, ever since then, we've had a lot to talk about. Um, David visited me in Vancouver um, and with Linda, his lovely wife, and you can see in the picture up there uh, that we're having dinner together in a restaurant in Vancouver. Um, while he was there, David had his 65th birthday and uh, you can see him celebrating with uh, members of my faculty. Um, he uh, also came that summer as a visiting scholar. And one of the things that we asked him to do was to teach a course for students who are in our early childhood education program. And uh, there was a little bit of confusion about getting the visa um, for David. And so he, we had to have him do what we refer to as um, kind of going around the flagpole. Um, one of the uh, staff members from UBC drove him down to the border and he had to cross the border into the United States, go around the flagpole <laughs> and, and to re-enter into, uh, into Canada. And he was interviewed there and the customs agent asked him, you know, you mean that you are one of just a very few people in the world that uh, studies what you study. And so, you know, it would be very rare that we could find anybody else to come to Canada to teach this, this course. And David um, thought for a moment and he said, well, Yes, as a matter of fact, that's true. But he always joked that um, what he left out of that answer was the fact that another person who could have uh, done that was me and I was already in Vancouver. Anyway, the customs agent let him through the, the border and he got his visa and was able to um, serve <laughs> in the role of instructor in that course for us. Um, we always had a good laugh about that. Um, subsequently, I served on the advisory board when David had his plans project in Cambridge. And so you can see down below um, David uh, in a punt, uh, which was something that he uh, had us do when we came to, to visit in, in Cambridge. And then finally, most recently in the, I think it was uh, June of uh, 2019, um, David uh, and I went to, or I guess I was in um, the UK and um, wanted to visit one of the sites that uh, David was working in. It was a, a preschool in London. And um, so here we are, what you don't see, you see me there uh, in the, the train station by platform uh, nine and three quarters for the Harry Potter fans. David um, was adamant that I had to stand and get my picture taken there. And what you don't see is that he's on the other side of the camera. So those are just a few of my memories um, of David uh, that I thought would I would share um, in his honor as we're honoring him in this talk. 
I also like to begin uh, my presentations um, with a custom that we have at UBC, which is to do a, a land acknowledgement. And just to acknowledge um, as part of our efforts at reconciliation with Indigenous um, peoples in our land, that um, at UBC, we have the privilege of working and learning um, on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. So with those brief introductions, I'm going to go on to, to my research and start a little bit by just outlining my, my priorities. Um, I've always been uh, focused on uh, supporting young children's self-regulated learning. And I guess that's kind of where David and I intersect in our, in our interests together. Um, my work has focused on classroom processes that are implicated in children's development of self-regulation. Um, so looking a lot at what teachers do and uh, say and how classrooms are set up um, to support children's self-regulation. Um, and David, of course, complimented that because he was always interested in looking at uh, what young children are doing um, in terms of, of self-regulated learning. So we kind of um, looked at, you know, how are opportunities presented for children and then how do children uh, take those opportunities up. Um, I, I also have been very focused on how it is that researchers and teachers can work together um, to support self-regulated learning uh, in classrooms and schools. And of course, that, again, was a shared interest of, of David's and mine. And in recent years, we had really been um, collaborating and sharing um, insights from our various projects, whether it was plans on his side or the longitudinal study that I'm going to talk about um, a little bit with you today on my side. So let me just begin by saying, talking a little bit about um, self-regulation, what, what, how I uh, look at it, um, define it from, from my point of view. Um, so here is a definition uh, that um, a group of grade one, two, and three students uh, provided um, for or worked out with their teacher. And they said that it was the ability to do your job without being asked, told, or shown. And I always think that's a terrific um, and very close uh, approximation to the, one of the first definitions that we got from uh, Barry Zimmerman who said that it was the ability to control your thoughts and actions to meet goals and respond to environmental demands. Um, David also emphasized how it was the ability to monitor um, and control aspects of, of human behavior. And also, I think that we have emphasized that it's that self-regulation applies to almost every aspect of um, our thought and action. So it's also related to motivation and emotion and uh, social interaction. Self-regulating learners um, attend to key features of the environment. They're able to resist distractions. They persist um, when they are challenged and they're able to respond adaptively and flexibly. Now, um, with young children and uh, so on, we tend to focus quite a bit on kind of some of those core processes, um, sometimes referred to as executive functions, uh, when we're talking about children's self-regulation. Um, when we talk about self-regulated learning, we also talk about higher levels of thought and particularly um, focus on three uh, different dimensions. Um, metacognition, strategic action, and motivation. So of course, metacognition refers to learners' awareness of their personal strengths as well as their challenges. Um, their awareness of strategies that can help them with um, learning and solving problems when they run into challenges. And it also uh, refers to their awareness of other people's interests and needs. And I think that's particularly important when we talk about children's learning in classrooms because they're interacting with others and they need to have that awareness of what um, others might need or how they might um, get help or, or uh, give help to others in that context. Um, strategic learners uh, are 
not only um, aware of strategies, but they also recognize which strategies are best for different situations. So they're proactive in their efforts to learn and uh, they're able to um, understand kind of when, where, and why strategies are going to be useful to them and also to adapt or make adjustments to strategies to, to make sure that they're serving their needs um, particular, uh, particularly well. So that kind of speaks to their adapt adaptiveness and, and their flexibility. Um, I like to say that um, metacognition and strategic action, those are critical for self-regulated learning. Those speak to the skills that learners need to have. And for David, um, metacognition was a particular focus. Um, but I also like to emphasize the importance of learners' will. So you can have skill, but you also need to have will. And that's where motivation comes in. So motivated learners believe um, that their abilities and skills can grow and change. They have uh, what has recently been referred to as a growth mindset. So they're willing to take risks and persist when tasks are challenging, which is particularly important um, because self-regulated learning takes effort. And if you think about it, when we need to be self-regulated is usually when we are working on something that's either new to us or a little bit challenging. Um, but self-regulating learners expect that they can succeed um, if they just uh, try um, and exert effective uh, or, and use strategies effectively. Um, they also, um, in the social realm, uh, are interested in celebrating the success of others. So it's not just that they're, they're kind of focusing on their own progress, but also willing to celebrate the success of others. Models of self-regulation tend to be cyclical and uh, they tend to focus on um, uh, or include uh, four different elements at least. Um, one is focusing or kind of understanding what is it that I'm being asked to do and understanding tasks and what you're being asked to do helps then in the planning um, and enacting of strategies that are going to help you. And then of course, critical is the reflection phase to think about whether in fact you're meeting um, the goals of particular tasks. And that reflecting stage um, sometimes is referred to as a feedback loop. Sometimes we get feedback from others, but importantly um, in the self-regulation process, uh, it's emphasized that we need to be kind of monitoring and making adjustments, which is giving feedback um, to ourselves. So why focus on self-regulated learning? Um, why has it become such an important uh, topic in education, but also across many of the uh, social and behavioral sciences in, in recent years? Um, we know from a good deal of research that self-regulation is a significant source of achievement differences among learners. Um, but we also know that self-regulation is a developmental process. So it can be learned, we can all improve um, in our self-regulation. And so even children who have exceptional learning needs can improve their self-regulated learning. And so when we're asked, you know, is it worth, um, uh, involving certain groups of learners in uh, self-regulation or trying to help them to achieve that? Aren't they always going to have some difficulties? Well, it's true that there are some groups of children that will struggle with self-regulated learning, um, but everybody uh, can improve and we have good data to, to demonstrate that. Um, in recent years, we've also expanded to not just think about regulation of learning <clears throat> from a personal or um, self uh, perspective, but also to recognize that the regulation of learning is supported um, by others who maybe have strengths that we don't have or information that we don't have. And so we talk um, about co-regulation and how parents co-regulate their children's um, regulation, but teachers do that in the classroom and even peers um, can co-regulate one another's learning. Um, 
we talk about socially shared regulation. And so when children are working in collaborative groups, um, sometimes they articulate shared goals and come to common understandings about um, plans um, and strategies for, for meeting those goals. And then finally, um, a graduate student of mine, doctoral student, um, coined the phrase socially responsible self-regulation. And this comes from the social responsibility and social competence literature to say that in order to regulate ourselves in effective ways, we need to um, understand um, the, our needs as well as the needs of others and be able to conduct ourselves um, and regulate ourselves in a socially responsible way. Research is, is coming to show that self-regulation is an asset that cuts across so socio-demographic boundaries. Um, certainly there's a lot more work to be done in the area of, kind of cross-cultural work um, related to self-regulation, but um, the work that's out there certainly um, suggests that this is a fruitful area for future research um, and that self-regulation is something that can support all learners um, and diverse learners in classrooms. And finally, I, SRL pairs well with current educational initiatives um, and innovations. So when teachers are engaging students in inquiry learning or playful learning or include, or when we're trying to achieve kind of inclusive environments for a diverse um, student population, or uh, even when we're doing assessment and thinking about how can we use assessment to promote learning, self-regulation, that metacognition, motivation, strategic action, all of those things are useful um, in, in, and can and fit very nicely into those kinds of um, initiatives and forms of learning. In my research, um, I have uh, articulated a set of classroom processes <clears throat> that I have found through um, observing in hundreds and hundreds <laughs> of, uh, of uh, tasks and activities in classrooms. Um, and uh, I have come to um, particularly emphasize for what I refer to as macro um, structures. And these come from my observations, but also the literature uh, on self-regulation and also self-determination. Um, so the four macro categories are things like um, providing supportive structures in the classroom um, and uh, the, also supporting student autonomy. Um, and scaffolding students' learning, and also creating a context in which there is a sense of community or group cohesion. Children feel like they are um, safe to try things out uh, in terms of their learning. Um, and when things don't work out, they know they can get help and someone from the community. So these are the macro um, structures and those are kind of the critical aspects. When I'm working with teachers, I get them to think, you know, what are you doing in these four different areas um, in terms of supporting students' self-regulation? And then of course, within those, we have micro categories. So what you see on the screen now is just um, a list of things under each macro category that um, indicates the kinds of things or the, the different areas in which um, and ways in which teachers might support children's uh, self-regulated learning. Then what we find in terms of children's learning is uh, that they demonstrate higher understandings of tasks, even when the tasks are complex. Um, they evidence more productive engagement uh, in learning and in self-regulated learning processes. They obtain higher ratings of achievement on tasks involving self-regulated learning. They give higher ratings of interest um, and importance to their classroom tasks. They report using more relevant strategies to accomplish tasks. And they report more nuanced emotional responses to tasks. Uh, and they give more elaborate and task-relevant explanations um, for those responses. 
So moving forward in this presentation, I just wanted to um, take a little bit of time to elaborate on the way on how it is that we work um, with teachers, because I think uh, in my work, um, the, the influences on this and uh, have, have led me to kind of want to advance um, a reciprocity in research agenda. And of course, classroom research has been my focus, but I know, you know, Sarah is moving into classroom research and there are other people in the room that are also doing um, classroom based research. And it really is a different breed of research. I'm talking about doing class when researchers are in classrooms doing research, working with teachers and studying kind of in-depth processes that are, that are going on in classrooms, rather than doing research about classrooms, which you know, can be the survey kind of getting students to answer surveys about what goes on and so on. So I think there are some things that are, deserve kind of particular consideration. Um, and there are different ways in which we work with, with teachers in those circumstances. So I just wanted to share a little bit of what influences the way that I work with students, with teachers, sorry, and uh, to give a little bit of an example from one uh, research project, a longitudinal study of how it is that we work with, with uh, teachers and then look at a little bit of what I consider to be the next steps driving uh, my agenda, but also thinking about um, just the, more, the broader agenda for classroom research and so on. So my work with um, teachers has always been informed by participatory approaches to research. So it's been operationalized in things like communities of practice um, or collaborative teachers collaborative inquiry or even research practice partnerships. Um, it's involved long-term collaborative relationships uh, with community partners. And so the goals of the research have been to address mutual interests, um, not solely the interest of the researcher, and to focus on problems of, of practice. So I've always, uh, you know, when I started looking at self-regulated learning, I have always been interested in thinking about, so how can we bring this to classrooms and how can we help um, teachers to make this um, part of their practice? Um, and so, uh, and we've also kind of been engaging in interactive cycles of planning, enacting, and reflecting. Now we draw when we're working with teachers on a framework that uh, two collaborators of mine, uh, uh, Judy Halbert and Linda Kayser um, developed. And in fact, if you Google um, spirals of inquiry, their materials framework, they have a spirals playbook and you can download it and um, have a look at it. They make it freely available and they um, use the, the spiral with teachers all in different countries all over the world. So it's been well um, practiced. Um, but basically they involve teachers in inquiry and uh, they go through a cycle of having teachers um, scanning, thinking about what's going on in their classrooms, where does their focus need to be, developing, uh, finding, and then once they have a focus, kind of thinking about um, how they're going to address it. Maybe they develop some hunches about what is a source of a problem or some hunches about why things are going a different way um, than maybe they had planned. They engage in professional learning, whether that is drawing on the expertise of colleagues, participating in a community of inquiry, um, and they take action in their classroom, they try things out, and then of course they reevaluate and think about whether there are some adjustments that they need to make. So you can imagine that the thing I like about the spirals of inquiry is that it really um, maps on to theories of self-regulated learning or models of self-regulated learning. So what we're trying to do is give teachers an opportunity to engage in the kinds of learning themselves that we want them to provide for, for their students. So we're trying to help them to become self-regulating learners so that they can then pass that on to their students. Now, this idea of reciprocity in research 
um, comes from readings. I don't know how many people are doing some reading about research practice partnerships or community-based um, participatory kinds of research where people are really um, talking about the fact that, um, and particularly in the field of educational psychology, we, we kind of lament as researchers about why it is that our knowledge um, and our great ideas are not getting into classrooms, they're not being taken up. And uh, I have a couple of colleagues at, um, or, or sorry, before I go there, um, one of the reasons that uh, Bill Penuel and his colleagues say is for that is that the research infrastructure tends to support a research to practice pipeline. And it's not a true partnership where um, researchers are gaining from their interactions with teachers, as well as passing on information um, to teachers. If you think about sometimes the way traditionally we've approached it, we talk even about going in and training um, teachers instead of going in and maybe sharing ideas or, or information and then finding out from them whether our ideas resonate with them or whether they would find those useful. So, um, Recently, there's been more talk about the role research should play in improving educational practice. And certainly I am heartened as I talk to a lot of the new um, researchers, and I'm gonna speak about my own field, educational psychology, I won't presume about other um, fields, but the junior um, scholars and even people who have been at it a little bit longer like myself are recognizing that that's, it's not, really very useful for researchers to go into classrooms and tell teachers what to do. Um, and that probably if we want to see the kinds of um, changes or you know, if we want to really have an impact on practice, then we need to position teachers centrally in our research um, efforts. And that you know, only by involving them um, in, in that way, in helping them to, in, when they are partners in the research, um, will we see those kinds of transformations or can we have that kind of impact? So there are lots of implications um, that this kind of thinking has on what we have traditionally thought of um, in terms of doing research. And so just to uh, kind of characterize what has been the research to practice pipeline, I mean, it typically involves kind of a researcher driven agenda. Um, and we have a lot of emphasis on control. You know, we want to be able to manage things and manipulate things and not have things um, that we can't explain. Um, we uh, researchers tend to want to stay distant from what's going on in the classroom so that we can be kind of objective. Um, and we've also had kind of an emphasis on finding what works kind of generally for, for everybody. And so if we want kind of this more reciprocal relationship, um, what uh, Penuel and others are saying is that we need to have more collaborative kinds of relationships. Um, we, and those relationships, and, and so our research needs to be built on relationship and we need to be doing it more in authentic um, kinds of context. And also to recognize that typically in classrooms, you can't have the same kinds of control that you have in a laboratory or clinical settings. Classrooms are messy places, if there's one thing I've learned um, through, my, through my research. And so we need to recognize that finding what works really requires considerations of where, with whom, and under what conditions it's going to work. It's not going to be necessarily one finding one thing that's going to work um, for the masses. But now the advantages to working in this way is that um, for practitioners, they tend to have increased access um, to research because the researchers are coming in and they're working with them in a, in a sustained um, kind of way. And that can lead to increased use of the research for making practice and policy decisions. Um, it also tends to lead to more usable kinds of interventions. 
which should make the interventions more sustainable. It increases capacity in the system. So it's not the researchers coming in and doing the interventions and then leaving, and then the intervention leaves the, the context. Rather, when you're working collaboratively and building capacity in the educators, then when you leave, hopefully they carry on. And so you have had some um, longer lasting uh, impact. And for researchers, uh, certainly I have found, and the research is suggesting, that you get a deeper level of commitment and engagement on the part of your participants. They feel that they are part of the process and valued and contributing. And also, they have, because they have a say, then the research can have meaning and, and be useful for them. And it also, for researchers, offers opportunities to develop and test theories in naturalistic contexts, which should lead to more robust, ecologically valid, and practical models of self-regulated learning um, or other things that you might be researching. So let me quickly then put all this into more of a concrete context, which is um, my longitudinal study. And this is a study of children developing self-regulation um, and from kindergarten through grade five. And so we were collecting data for this pre-pandemic um, from the time children entered, we called them the kindergarten cohort. They entered kindergarten in the year 2013, 2014, and they finished grade five in uh, 2018, 2019. And we followed those kids through each year. And each year we worked with the teachers who had the kids. Um, so uh, the teachers, and this is an interesting, um, I guess, methodological as also logistical challenge. Uh, when we started the study, I wanted to do something that was quite traditional in terms of long focus back on the kids. Um, and so I wasn't planning to be working as closely with teachers. But what I found was that it was very hard to get teachers to volunteer to participate. They didn't want a researcher coming in and collecting data about the kids. They, if they were gonna participate, they wanted it to be a professional learning experience. And so I revamped the whole um, study to include teachers each year um, and to work with them, with them closely as well as studying uh, the children. Um, there were three kinds of activities that we engaged in um, during each year with the teachers. And these were, we referred to as learning team meetings. So the teachers actually coming together with the researchers to plan um, the research then enact and come back and reflect. Between learning team meetings, we had, the researchers went to classrooms. So we had classroom visits. Um, in which we observed what they were doing, we debriefed with teachers, um, and then we also had teachers involved uh, in collecting data and also determining what the kinds of data would be that we would be collecting. And so across the year, these uh, activities kind of, we cycled through these activities. So there were three learning team meetings a year, fall, once, kind of fall in the January, February time, and then in the spring. And those were interleaved with our classroom visits um, and our data collection. So researchers and teachers tended to be in touch with each other on average every kind of uh, four, four weeks or, or so. So there was a lot of contact, even though just the three um, learning team meetings. Um, oh, sorry, I should have put that through. So what I want to um, describe now is kind of, so what happened in those learning team meetings and how did we use those kind of collaborate, collaborative um, uh, group working uh, context in terms of pushing the research forward. So in our learning team meetings, we use those to focus obviously on our shared goal of supporting self-regulated learning um, and we worked with teachers to co-construct kind of curriculum linked and formative opportunities for children to develop self-regulated learning. Those opportunities were embedded in complex, meaningful tasks, 
in the classrooms. They gave students opportunities to demonstrate their metacognition, motivation, and strategic action. They showed how our efforts to support SRL were making a difference or that was our goal. We tried to design things where children could reveal their self-regulated learning in the context of those activities and include, um, and the, the um, activities included a common set of elements. So as teachers came together from across classrooms and across schools, they developed activities that had things in common but they also were flexible enough to um, let teachers, in fact, in, implement them in some sense in their own way. And I have to um, give a nod to David on this because it was uh, from interacting with him about his plans project that we actually came up with this idea of working with teachers to, on these common tasks. Originally, what we had been doing was just saying to teachers, well, whatever you're doing, we'll come and look at it and we, you know, work with that. But then it will be found as researchers. That was great for teachers because they could have their SRL projects and be developing materials and, and doing things with their students in classrooms. But it wasn't so great for researchers who need that kind of common thread to look at things from a more bird's eye view. So the compromise was let's find something like when the kids were in grade three, the, the grade three teachers said, well, I'd like to think about the writing process and how we could support self-regulated learning in terms of the writing process. So that was kind of the common thread and they identified specific things that they could all do. But then they had the freedom of saying, well, my writing project might be a little bit different than, than the others. And similarly, in grade four and five, they decided on a particular area in which they would develop um, tasks, but um, there was flexibility um, also in how they did it. The other thing they did, and I don't know that you can make out the, the writing on this, but this is more of a prompt for me to just tell you that as we worked in those um, uh, uh, learning team meetings, the teachers, each time they came, filled out this kind of template that just kind of supported them to engage in, in the reflection process, to think about um, what they had been trying in terms of, of self-regulated learning, think about how it went, what did, had they observed, what had they learned, so what, would, what did they interpret from what they saw, and what kinds of changes did they think they might like to make for the next time. So that kind of framework just supported, and you can see again, kind of the, the cycle there. Um, with respect to uh, our, our learning team meetings, um, we had planned to bring, we had nine schools involved in the project. And at first we started um, releasing, we had funding to release teachers so that they could all come together in a central location and it would be great because they would not only get to work with teachers within their school, but also across schools. And of course, we then ran into the log logistical um, issue of uh, shortage of teachers on call, which are the teachers that would um, fill in for the teachers. And that went on for a long time as a political issue I won't go into, but from a research perspective, it meant we didn't have TOCs to release the teachers to come out of their classrooms. So creatively with the teachers and the administrators at the school and so on, we worked out a schedule where we would go into individual schools and have learning teams of the teachers involved in the study, usually two to four um, teachers in the school in a year, if you think about numbers of teachers teaching grade three in a, in a school in a year. Um, and so we worked with them individually. Um, and same thing within the learning team meeting, we, we in the fall had them kind of introduced to the, into, to the project, begin to think about what they might like to have as a common focus, and also as their individual focus. The second time, second iteration was a focus more on these common tasks and actually developing them and then implementing them. And then the third kind of cycle through was reflecting on how that implementation had gone and what it is that they might like to do next. So that kind of solved our problem of 
kind of within a school, they were we were able to get enough TOCs to cover and have teachers working with us. But it didn't solve the problem of that cross school communication, which the teachers still wanted to have. So in this next figure, I've kind of shown you the same thing, but from the point of view of how it is we develop those common tasks, still giving teachers the opportunities to communicate with one another. The researchers served as the kind of liaison or the conduit of information. And so if you see in the first iteration there, LT1 stands for now not learning team meeting one, but, the, but say learning team at, a, at school one. Um, they came up with a proposal. Um, so they might say, here's an idea of an area we could focus in. And here are some things we think could be common elements. Here are some things we'd like to have as flexible um, ideas. And then we took that to the next school, the second learning team, and offered it to them. And they were able to respond to that to say, well, I like this piece of it, or we could build, and I think this could happen. And so we built those tasks across the school. At the end of the day, when we'd been through all the schools and gotten all the feedback, um, we cycled back and presented the task to everybody, got their feedback agreement, and then um, it was implemented across the class. So I guess I'm sharing this to just as an, to say, you know, here's what classroom research or school-based research is all about. Um, it's, it's messy work and, and oftentimes um, it takes some creative uh, problem solving. Um, so here's kind of what we found uh, for teachers in terms of their learning or what they got out of the collaboration. So certainly they gained knowledge um, about children's development of self-regulated learning. Um, and they benefited, I think, um, and I hear uh, from, no or sorry, we benefited from knowledge that teachers um, gained. So it gave us the information that we needed to have. And together we examined how well our co-constructed innovations um, were able to work. And teachers came, teachers came to the project with different beliefs and understandings about SRL. This is the other thing that I think was an important um, outcome. You know, we kind of assume that every, when we go and take our um, ideas or our interventions or whatever, that every teacher is starting from the same place. And for sure, that wasn't the case in our project. Some teachers had quite a deep understanding and value for self-regulated learning. Others maybe had no knowledge. It was a new idea for them. And others had been exposed to professional learning, um, things that really left them with misconceptions about self-regulated learning. So um, I think as we're working with teachers, there are individual differences, just as there are when you're working with children. And so, but I do feel like even with those differences, they benefited from experiencing opportunities like those we wanted to have them to give for their, for their students. And just as a little bit of insight about that, I'll play, what time have we got here? Ah, we're running out of time. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'll play the teachers so you can hear from the teachers what they feel like they got out of the process and then maybe skip to um, the end. Uh, even though it, it will not be the end of my talk, but I'll, I'll try and wrap it up in some cohesive way. Uh, I hope the sound comes through. Through the different inquiry projects that I worked on and through the different learning opportunities I was given, I was able to see kids in a new way it really helped me to see just how there is so much more going on than just academics in the classroom. And it helped me focus on some of those strategies to help my students be more successful. SRL came in at a time when it just empowered my own, my own intuition as, as a teacher. This is the way I want to get the kids to actually respond and, and collaborate together. So it was, it was very good time for me and quite fun. My participation in the project helped me see learning in a more holistic way. As a teacher, 
Whenever I consider how I'm going to teach a topic, I'm naturally drawn to the contents and how I deliver it. However, SRL helped me recognize the significance of what the learner brings to the experience, as well as the learning environment. With that community and the framework with SRL, it was just amazing to learn about the different ways of engaging the students in the first place, but then to hear how other teachers were incorporating that in a variety of forms of creativity that would come through them was fascinating. And I felt it was actually quite relieving to hear other teachers talk about where they were struggling and feel like there was commonality in there and that that was uh, useful to hear what they had been through, but also what, what they had done to work. I truly developed a new vision of teaching where the teachers and the students are partners, co-constructing criteria, sharing ownership of the learning, and really focusing more on the strategies that were underneath the learning, which gave the students the foundation they needed to know themselves as learners and to know what strategies they needed to use to be successful. Okay. So, I mean, you can even see through those four examples that there are differences among those teachers in terms of what they might understand or how they're implementing and what they've gotten out of the project. Um, and so I really feel for us in terms of next steps in the work that we're doing with teachers, we're looking to probe the reasons for those natural variations. Um, you know, how is it that teachers come, you know, help us to understand, how can we understand better um, what it is that, te how teachers come to the project? And then how can we use that information um, to support them in their development of understandings about SRL and how to support it? Um, and so toward that end, we've been working now um, with our teacher data, um, rather than, I think this is another, uh, uh, critique I'll make of our fields, educational psychologies, we tend to love to have dichotomies. And so we talk about things as being high or low. And I became very uncomfortable with talking about teachers as being kind of high on SRL or low on SRL um, and not really understanding what, you know, why they would be, or I, I thought that just seemed unfair. And so we've moved more to looking at kind of, there are clusters of teachers they might emphasize different things. And even with regard to that four quadrant thing that I talked about, some teachers maybe focus more on the structural elements, some more on the autonomy support. Um, and so, but they are supporting self-regulated learning. They're just all on a different journey. And so we're trying to think about, you know, if there are differences across teachers, what kinds of differences matter? And how do we then um, help them in their learning and their development? So I was going to kind of go through where we are with this clustering. Um, we've kind of come up with a, a model for that, but I won't go into that. Maybe we'll get it published and you'll be able to read about it. Um, but I really think in terms of moving the uh, reciprocity in research agenda forward, certainly for us, um, we have found that we need to be actively thinking um, about various kinds of challenges and rethinking some of the ways in which we um, engage with research. Certainly, I've tried to kind of, as I've gone, articulate some of the methodological, um, logistical, but there are also ethical um, challenges when you're doing this work with teachers in honoring um, them and, and what they bring to the study. Um, and so for us as researchers, maybe I'll just also um, say that more generally beyond my project, maybe as a challenge to the group, um, we might start to rethink what we judge or the judgments we make about quality um, research and going back to that kind of research to practice pipeline. Um, think about the way we think about some of these more traditional ideas. So I've started to think about rather than fidelity of implementation, more integrity. So are, do teachers understand the general principles and are they um, implementing those with um, integrity? And, and that may be an easier thing for them to do in their context than to be doing something long step that researchers have uh, 
um, designed. Um, also, instead of thinking about generalizability as we do in research, thinking about transferability. Um, is there something in the research that resonates with teachers that they can make use of? Is there a transfer um, a opportunity there? Um, scope versus scale. Um, and I think actually though there are, I've been talking with uh, researchers for a project I'm working on um, who are engaged in classroom-based research. And many of them are taking this work to scale, which is challenging in and of themselves, but they're still managing um, to involve like teachers and working with districts and people in the district so that it's not about the researchers agenda, it's still about the practice agenda. Um, and I guess we just want to think about the transformative potential of what it is that we're doing. If it has no trans, if it doesn't have the possibility of making a difference, a positive difference in schools, then what are we about? What are we doing? At least that's in my, my view of things. And for, um, it, you know, in terms of communication and dissemination, it's about that mobilization and animation, <coughs> not just sending information out. Um, a genuine knowledge exchange. And then finally, I think for people who are moving through the ranks, uh, I, I talk to a lot of uh, young scholars who really want to engage in this kind of research, but they're worried that the institution won't support them in it. And so I think some of our institutional incentives um, and the ways in which we uh, um, think about research need to change in order to invite that involvement from, from junior people. Um, so I think I will stop there. I was going to share a couple of projects. Um, one of them that, in, that David was really instrumental in getting off the ground, which is called the Connections um, Project. And it's a group of international scholars. Sarah's involved. We have Teresa Hopkins back in the back. She's also involved. Um, where we are trying to get material. We're developing things that will share what we have and have experienced with practitioners, but also invite practitioners to feed into our work and make their work publicly um, available. So those are the kinds of things uh, that we're working on now. Sorry, everybody, that I <laughs> about. I hope that the, I hope the the uh, volume turned out okay in the end. Yeah. <laughs> Can. I don't know how much time you want to uh, feel the fuel. Sure, Great. sure. Great. Thank you so much. That was absolutely brilliant. And I'm just thinking, ooh, the people that I've spotted in the audience and different kind of perspectives on what might be going on. So hopefully some of you might have questions. I think it might be possible to take one or two from the online audience if I'm Krishna I just want to pull out has it. Yeah, yes, yes. Just letting letting our online audience know. Any questions for Kathy? <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for Kathy? <laughs> or Kathy? Yeah, yeah. No, wherever. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that I was really struck by is actually your last, your last slide here where you're talking about um, judgments of quality in research. And I think that is a very live discussion and I was looking here, Pam Bernardi was here earlier and I think she um, just popped out of the room, but she's just recently edited a collection of essays on this question. That's in the arts research area. And so for me, I saw it and I thought, well, of course, the arts people are going to be very creative about the ways you might judge quality and the outputs, um, even the word output, you know, has a kind of tone to it about something that has to be measurable. But nevertheless, um, coming from them, I guess it wasn't so surprising, but if you start to think about it in psychological research, uh, I would say we have, we actually have quite a ways to go still in, in you know, these, um, perhaps you could call them more democratic yes. processes. Yeah. Yeah. So have you, I mean, have you tried things that have worked well? <laughs> well, 
I mean, I think these common tasks, for example, I think David's idea was brilliant and just helped me so much because, um, you know, when the project, so we, we studied these children from kindergarten until grade five. And for the first couple of years in the project, we took this approach with the teachers that, um, you know, we want to come in and observe in your classroom so many times. And we actually, we brought them together so that the teachers were coming together and we were talking about different practices for self-regulated learning, but we weren't um, require, we weren't asking them to implement particular kinds of tasks and stuff. We, we tried going and just seeing what they were doing and seeing if we could, but then what we found was we really had apples and oranges across the classroom. So that's where we came in with this um, kind of common task. And we have, I mean, we had quite a bit of success with that. So in um, grade three, it was a writing um, project that, that teachers did in grade four. It was inquiry learning in grade five. It was kind of the research um, process. And, you know, we, and I've spent the afternoon with Sarah's group kind of sharing different tools that we developed even with teachers. Um, but they were things that I think the teachers could go on and use. One of them is, was a learning log that um, we developed with teachers. And it helped us to assess children's um, kind of metacognition, strategic action, how they um, were monitoring, whether they could generate solutions to problems they were having. Um, but teachers could use them in that way too. So they, they were both kind of a good research tool and a classroom friendly um, approach. So yeah, and we were able to then collect learning logs from all the grade three children in the project and, and have a sense of, of that. I think that willingness to experiment is a very uh, David <laughs> characteristic. Um, yeah. And he always had this kind of assurance about him that, you know, it'll be okay, let's try it this way. Yeah. Um, and I think turning that, turning that playfulness into something that is rigorous and that um, can be embedded in our research practices is an interesting challenge to take on. It'll probably also involve us looking again at our textbooks and the chapters we regularly refer our students to when we say, oh, go read about validity and reliability. That's not necessarily, you know, the kind of um, standard or the, the, the classic texts yeah. wouldn't necessarily incorporate these, these approaches. So that this is, I think it's, it's very novel and very promising really. Yeah. To see. Well, and I think, I mean, certainly David um, did this and we talked about I mean, it was one of the things that we would talk about when we would get together is just the challenges of, of doing this. But I think we both kind of felt that you needed to catch kids being self-regulated in real um, time and real situations. And that that had to happen with kind of authentic tasks. We talked a little bit this afternoon too. It's like the closer the, the closer your assessment of their self-regulation is tied to the thing you want them to be self-regulated about, the better actually the data that you get. So, yeah. I have a question. Um, you knew when they thought about the book, but it was comfortable in the pictures where I saw that one of the teachers had like the red, yellow, green um, kind of stoplight. And I remember hearing a story from a family friend that their child like, didn't remember what they learned in school, but they remember what color they ended up. And I'm curious as you start focusing on self regulated learning strategies, because that seems like how are kids reflecting on what they learned? Are they like focusing? Do you see it in them focusing on like reflecting on the content that they've learned? Are they already the same way that they're reflecting on strategies to learn? Yeah, and I think in the classrooms where I've worked, I've seen both. Um, and probably, and they need to reflect on both, right, to be successful. But a lot of it is it's driven by the questions. So one of the, you know, if you remember again in the um, four quadrant box, um, metacognitive questioning, um, and teachers kind of use that to support uh, learners. So they might ask a question that prompts them to think about, you know, how was your actual performance or what. Um, did you learn versus how did you learn? And I know, uh, I think we talked about the grade five teachers put in three 
pretty open-ended questions, kind of what are you learning? How is it going? Um, have you stretched yourself? And then what are you planning to do next? So the what is different from the how, um, and then what are you gonna do next? Could go any kind of direction, but you might, teachers might prompt kids to focus on um, things that they're learning in terms of content versus things they might be learning in terms of strategies or, you know. Going to, we're going to be very playful and experiment live. Um, thank you, Krishna, for suggesting this. Is it okay if I mm -hmm. exit here? So what we are hoping to be able to do is see the question on the um, Zoom. Is it this way? I can't see it on this one, so can you? Uh, what's the matter research is being done on nurturing self-regulation using thinking? There's Sorry, you'll have to read that again. <laughs> I'm distracted. Um, Self-regulation learning using thinking has research been done around that domain. Um, to open the question again, if that hasn't helped. Well, I guess I'm thinking that I'm not, I don't know if I understand the question. Okay. Um, I want to know if research has been done on nurturing self-regulation using thinking. I had a conversation with David regarding my work in kindergarten, but unfortunately it's been pursued. Huh. Well, I would imagine you can't be very self-regulated without thinking. Um, so I'm imagining, so, but what, I guess the question might be kind of, what are you thinking about, right? So with regard to self-regulated learning, we might be prompting students to think about um, their strengths <laughs> and challenges and so on with respect, understanding themselves as a learner. We might be asking them to think about um, aspects or features of particular tasks so that then they could make judgments about what they bring to that and what might make them successful or not, um, or to think about uh, strategies and so on. Um, and I, I also think that teachers might use metacognition and that to push children's thinking in particular areas. There's no um, doubt about that. So you might, you know, challenge. Yeah. So I don't know if I'm answering the question exactly as the person might have wanted, but that's my off the top feeling about thinking and self regulated learning. Yeah. I have a more conceptual question. So there are some sets which were against with the concept of positive functions. What is your opinion? How does that fit with those models of self-regulated learning? Is that more cognition or something more cognitive or more different than what constitutes self-regulated learning? Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's a I Oh, for the audience. So the question had to do with the difference between executive, if there is a difference between executive function and self-regulated, um, maybe self-regulation or self-regulated learning. Um, and I know, you know, some people, um, I kind of think of uh, executive function, particularly kind of the core processes like inhibition um, and so on as being, Kind of the, the basic aspect. So I, I could cite, for example, Adele Diamond does a nice job of talking about what she refers to as kind of lower order and then higher order. And so I think she would distinguish um, kind of the more um, medical, she talks about planning and so on as being higher order. So she might not specifically label metacognition, I, I think in her writings or something, but things that she talks about as being higher order executive function would fit with, with what we refer to um, that way. Um, the thing I think that is more missing with the more executive function focus um, with self-regulation is sometimes the higher order thinking, like sometimes those are left out of those models. Um, and also more the motivational or affective. So it does tend to lean toward more the cognitive um, side. 
but you know these are the debates even within like the self-regulated learning community you know there's arguments about you know is self-regulation subsumed in metacognition or is metacognition part of um, self-regulation so there are all these uh, debates for maybe their researchers to have I guess the question is you know from a practitioner's point of view does that do they just need to know what these pieces are that they need to be promoting in their classrooms? There's another question online from Emma that says, have you been able to get back to the staff to see if they're still using the common tasks or their new SRL knowledge to enhance their teaching skills? Well, if I had been able to show you some of the work that we're doing with the Connections um, project, we actually have been reaching back to teachers to invite them to share some of the things that they've been doing. So over the course of the pandemic, um, that's kind of work that we've been engaged in. And so I think, yes, I mean, teachers in the project, they develop things for their classrooms. It might, so they might not still be using things that we used as shared tools, but oftentimes things that they developed for themselves, which might be, um, I'm just thinking of one woman who developed kind of a contract that she used with her students every time they engaged in a in a project and you know they would start by setting goals and then um, you know each time as they were working through their project they kind of did an assessment about whether they were meeting their goals and so on um, other teachers I know one teacher who developed uh, well the one that developed the definition of self-regulation with her class um, she uh, she said well that's really good that's what self-regulation looks like when it's all said and done you're doing your job you're not having to be asked told or shown but how do we get there and so they created this elaborate um, uh, rubric about you know what do we, you know what is our we need to know what our job is and we need to know what do we need in order to be successful at our job and so on and they posted that on the wall in their classroom and she said you know we use that in almost everything that we do in the classroom because you can ask you know if you're struggling you can just go right back to the basic and say well what's my job and what do I need to do my job and how am I doing at doing my job um, and so uh, I would say, yeah, there are examples uh, I have where teachers have done it and teachers have shared those things with colleagues and those things have, you know, other colleagues have taken them and built on them um, and so on. So, yeah, I mean, I can't say that to a teacher, but I do know um, of instances where they, they certainly have carried on. Um, it's interesting because, of course, you see in 2019, the next year we started into data collection got completely shut down with the pandemic around the time that we would be doing the common task. And um, so interestingly, you know, it would have been a great, it would have been wonderful if teachers um, could think about, well, how then, like what a time to support self-regulated learning when kids are at home and so on. And, um, but teachers didn't have the bandwidth for having research <laughs> documenting all of that. So I, you know, I can imagine that some teachers were probably doing that and maybe others, it was too much, but I don't know. Great, well, I think um, we can say, as far as knowing one's job and doing it, you've done an amazing job <laughs> this lecture, despite some of the challenges we threw at you. So thank you for bearing with us and for, sharing an incredible program of work and um, homage to David at the same time. Well done, thank you so much.